And the human mind is an interesting thing in that the conscious part of it, the, con the part of your brain that deals with, you know, you, your thinking, your faculties, your, your conscious mind, um, that is only a tiny, tiny fraction uh, of our mental faculties, of our mental capacities. Um, so we as biased and flawed human beings, we tend to think like the things that we find most impressive must be the most uh, intellectually rigorous or the most computationally challenging. So we think we, we, we might look at things uh, that animals can't do and conclude that these are the greatest signs of human intelligence. Uh, think like writing and speaking of works of art and poetry, scientific reasoning, uh, or like if you really want to get to the, you know, a grandiose thing, like think of the works of Shakespeare or if discovering E equals MC squared you know and we th and and these are what we consider our greatest intellectual triumphs because in terms of conscious ability uh, these particular examples uh you know shakespeare shakespeare's sonnets and einstein's relativity those had to be figured out by a conscious human mind there's not some portion of the brain dedicated to solving relativity there's no portion of the brain dedicated to you know writing stories well it gets a little more subtle but um so our biases lead us to conclude that these uniquely human things must be the greatest works of pure intellect we can imagine. In other words, they must somehow represent the vast bulk of our mental computations. And from a certain lens, they are. However, human, you know, scientists have studied the mind. Many great and brilliant people have dedicated their entire lives and careers to unlocking it, its mysteries. And it turns out that we are kind of, if we consider, you know, the works of Einstein to be our greatest computational challenges, mental computational challenges, that is just a case of us applying our biases to our own minds. It turns out that these various works of intellect are actually not what we spend the vast, vast majority of our brain power on. And you don't have to be the next Einstein for this to be the case. Uh, if you're a student taking a calc class, a calculus class, and you spend a day solving calculus practice problems, you might conclude that during that day, most of your mental computation, most of your mind, most of your brain itself uh, was dedicated to solving those problems. But really, it turns out the mind is a lot weirder than we ever thought it was. That's actually not the case. That's not how the human mind works. Regardless of what you're concentrating on and, and how hard you concentrate, even if you spend your entire day working on intellectually challenging work, you will actually not spend the majority of your mental capacity on those tasks. If a task is something you can consciously concentrate on, it will never represent a more than a small percentage of your brain's overall processing power. Now, is this because of the old like canard of like you only use 20% of your brain is true? Is there is is that kind of is that is that what I'm getting at? No, far from it. Uh, your brain, your entire brain is useful. Um, there is not some vast well of, you know, uh, untapped potential just waiting to be plumbed. Um, rather, it's because your conscious mind, the part of your uh, mind that deals directly with thinking and reasoning, that's only a small portion of your mind. Your conscious mind is but a, but the, you know, the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And again, this isn't some new age nonsense about metaphysically expanding your brain, you know, opening up a third eye or other kind of, or other such woo. There isn't some vast well of mental capacity just waiting to be plumbed if you meditate just right. Rather, it's because the vast majority of your mind is really needed for just ostensibly mundane everyday tasks. Um, again, think about how the human mind arose. You are not an amorphous, you know, cloud existing in, in space somewhere. Uh, you're not some amorphous spiritual thing living on another planet of existence. You are a creature. You are a human being. You are a creature that has evolved over millions of years to will to live and dwell here. You have you you are the uh, you know the end of this long series of evolution. And you are a creature that has evolved over millions of years to live and dwell as a social organism in living in a three-dimensional terrestrial environment. You know, you sit right where you are now. You sit atop a, well, you know, what, I, what, I, what I've heard and uh, uh, love to create, what love to uh, poetically refer to as, uh, you sit atop the four billion year deep corpse pile known as Darwinian evolution. You and all of your ancestors, going back to the, to the, some single-cell amoeba, have had to exist, live, eat, reproduce, and die in this same physical world that we live in. 
there are entire areas of the human brain dedicated to what we consider to be very mundane tasks. Uh, there are parts of the brain just for breathing, just parts for uh, sensing pain and temperature, parts for processing visual information and recognizing objects. If I hold this object here up, uh, you know what this is. This is a phone. You could call it a smartphone. Uh, if someone, and, and you know, you could go deeper if you are uh, really interested in phones and models and manufacturers. You know, if I took this phone out of its case and showed it to you, you could, you might even, if you were uh, particularly well versed in that, you might not even be able to tell me the uh, actual manufacturer model number, etc., or model, etc. You know, we have parts of our brain that do nothing, that are dedicated to nothing but just identifying common objects. Um, so, uh, you know, you have parts of the brain dedicated to uh, doing nothing but identifying faces. Uh, you know, we have a ton of our brain, a big part of our brain that is just to identify faces. That's it. Um, identify faces, the people associated with those faces, and not just that, but the emotional uh, memories associated with them. If, uh, you know, if you see a, you know, you can put someone in an MRI machine and uh, I guess an fMRI machine and, you know, show them a picture of, um, you know, uh, one of their loved ones and their brain, parts of their brain will light up. And, you know, those are the parts of the brain associated with recognizing faces and recognizing uh, emotional content. So like you could show them a picture of a stranger and certain parts of their brain will light up and you could show them a picture of a close family member or a friend and these areas plus some other areas would light up. The uh, parts of the brain that are just about recognizing recognizing faces will light up for both of them. But the part that that is that goes to recognizing, you know, individuals that you have emotional ties to, those will light up as well. If you uh, show someone a picture of a uh, family member, or I suppose the same, could sh the same could happen if you so showed a picture of someone to someone uh, that had negative emotions associated with them. So, uh, or, you know, doing something as simple and mundane as throwing a, bra throwing a ball, uh, walking down a set of stairs, or identifying a common object is, you know, we think of these as simple, simple, simple tasks, but by doing so, we betray their complexity. So, you know, think about how hard you had to work to learn how to walk. You know, uh, I don't think very few of us, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers actually learning how to walk, but if you've ever seen a very young child, an infant, you know, we are not born learning how to walk. It is a, we actually have to work at it. We have to learn, we have to practice, we have to, you, you know, you have to first learn how to crawl, then you sort of, you well, actually first learn how to sit up, then you learn how to crawl, then you learn how to walk, then you have to run. Uh, if you have, and, and some people, if you, they have certain injuries or brain damage, they have to go through that whole process all over again. So things that we consider to be very simple and mundane tasks are actually uh, very complicated, sometimes require, you know, immense neural processing, often involving very specialized and purpose dedicated structures in the brain. And also, unlike general purpose computers, uh, you know, a, a computer processor or a graphics card, they are not tuned to a particular task. They are general purpose devices. Uh, but unlike a computer, the parts of our brain that are dedicated to specific tasks, to, to specific tasks, are higher are hardwired to those tasks. Um, again, unlike a general purpose computer, the parts of the brain built for specific tasks are evolved from the cellular hardware up specifically to perform that task with the highest efficiency possible. And we don't, it's not, and it's not like we just identify objects. We don't just walk into a living room and see a chair, a couch, a rug, or a table. When walking into a room in an instant, we'll not only see and identify those objects, but in our minds, we'll form a complex three-dimensional map of the room, which we can then instantly use to navigate through the room. We fund, in other words, we fundamentally are embodied organisms. We are organisms that have evolved over hundreds of millions and billions of years to exist in a three-dimensional world. We, you know, how we process uh, operating in an environment, how we process recognizing objects, it goes far beyond what happens in just a image, uh, you know, a machine vision system, which just tries to identify the location of a hand-shaped object. You know, it's so, uh, there's a lot more depth and a lot more specialization that goes into the human mind or even animal minds. 
So it is always tempting to view the human mind as independent from our physical form, you know, to see ourselves as this like detached software piloting some sort of meat robot. Or if you want to go more at classical terms, you know, like Cartesian dualism, the mind body problem, etc. Um, you know, and actually the very origin of consciousness remains one of the greatest challenges in science and philosophy, uh, often referred to as the hard problem of consciousness, which, you know, you can look up and it, there's, uh, there have been en endless uh, bottles of ink spilled on that topic. Um, but again, your awareness does not exist independently of your body. To see a simple example of that, consider how your physical environment and your personal, you know, uh, physical condition affects your mental state. Think about what happens to your mood when you get really hungry, or in the opposite case, when you've just eaten a big meal. Uh, think about how um, uh, your mental state slows down uh, when you get sleepy and your body needs, needs rest. Uh, think of all, the, or, or on a more humorous note, think of all the foolish things human beings have done uh, simply to impress uh, other humans or pursue romantic interests. Ultimately, we are here. We are of this place, this world, this three-dimensional reality. We are ultimately embodied organisms. Our minds, our bodies, our beliefs and actions, you know, our, our minds, beliefs and actions are just as dependent on the physical world as anything else in this universe.